Hello everyone, and welcome back to another GIS lecture video. And in this lecture video, we're going to continue our discussion on spatial data by actually talking about the non-spatial data part of it. So in the previous videos, right, we've talked about how spatial data is a combination of the spatial part and the non-spatial part. And we talked about the spatial part in depth in terms of vector data model and raster data model. But now I want to talk about the non-spatial part, right? And this is typically the part where we're most interested in, right? Because we want to take this, the stuff that we care about in the real world and make it spatial. Well, now we've made it spatial, right? We've, we've got a vector data model or a raster data model. But what about, what about the data that we actually collected, right? How do we, how do we talk about that? And what and how can we categorize it in meaningful ways to make good decisions as we progress farther into GIS to talk about different types of analyses? So what I want to talk about first is going to be this idea of categories of non-spatial data. Let's go ahead and give ourselves some room here. And we're going to talk about categories of non-spatial data. Right, categories of non-spatial data. So what do I mean when I say non-spatial data? Right, these, these are things that you've collected about a, lo a location or about a particular object, right? So for example, if you're dealing with, I know I used this example before, right? If we're dealing with fire hydrants, oops, let's use a different color, right? If we're dealing with fire hydrants, for example, right? We would have the location of the fire hydrant, right? This would likely be a point vector data. Right, point vector data because we're dealing with the location. So this is the spatial part. But then there's all these other things that we know about the fire hydrant, right? Maybe we know maybe we know its color, whether it's red, green, blue, or yellow. And those colors may be important for maybe, maybe you know, administrating whether or not they're different municipalities or maybe they have a different um, system of, of governments in terms of who's in charge of maintaining them, right? Maybe we know the pressure, right? If we turn the fire hydrant on, right, how, how much pressure is that water going to have? which is going to have impacts for, you know, how, how capable is it of, of fighting fires from different distances, right? Maybe it's part of a network and we need to know, you know, what other hydrants it's connected to. Right? Maybe the fire hydrant has an ID code. Actually, it likely has an ID code, right? Something that identifies it, whether it's a number or, or a string of numbers and letters that say that we know, not based on location, but based on records, what fire hydrant this is. All right, these things here, right, these, right, these are all non-spatial data. And when we talk about non-spatial data, we need to be careful about the different categories 
of data that we can collect because there are different limitations on what each category can do. Oh, and just for the sake of being able to have um, some more options here, another thing that we might want to have know about is the quality. Right? Is it its state of repair? Right? Slash state of repair. And maybe we want to know the elevation, right? How high off the ground is the fire hydrant? Is it on a pole or something like that? And so when we talk about non-spatial data, when we talk about categories, there are four categories. of non-spatial data. And generally speaking, these categories decrease the limitations as we go down them. So the most limiting is going to be the first category. And as we go down, we're going to get to the least limited. The first category is going to be something called nominal. Data. And basically, nominal data the way I like to think of it, nominal means name. So nominal data is going to be adjectives about the data, about the object. Right, so these are non-numeric. Meaning, even if you have a number, like say 1001, that doesn't mean 1001. Right? That's what I mean when I say it's non numeric. Um, the key thing with nominal data is there are adjectives about the data that don't have any, that don't imply an order or a rank. That do not imply order or rank. I'm going to do that because the do not is the key part here. So you can think of nominal as being something like a name, right? Like my name is John, right? Someone else's name might be Tom. Someone else's name might be Susie, right? They're non-numeric, right? They, we can't add or subtract or do any math with them. And they also don't imply an order, right? We can't say that John is better than Tommy is better than Susie, right? There's no order there. So typically, nominal data are things like colors, like red, green, blue, usually names, slash unique IDs, Right. These are the two most often utilized nominal data sets, right? Color, unique ID. Adding, removing some of those limitations, right? Because with nominal data, we can't add or subtract them. They're not numeric. We can't do any sort of ranking because they don't imply a rank. So removing a limitation from nominal data, we get to what's called ordinal data, right? And so ordinal data is going to be the same concept as nominal, right? It's, a, it's an adjective about the data or about an object, right? Again, these are non-numeric. But the thing is, in this case, they do imply ranking, 
right, that do imply an order or rank. I'm gonna underline do here, right? Because that's the key. The key distinction between nominal and ordinal is that ordinal actually allows us to rank the data. So one common example of ordinal data would be if you think about any sort of competition, right? You can think about the Olympics that happened recently, right? At the end of any given competition, right, you have a first place, a second place, and a third place, right? Those are non-numeric, right? You can't subtract second place from first place, right? There's no math involved there. But they do imply an order of ranking, right? You can objectively say that first place did better than second place. Another good example where we have ordinal data come up a lot is in qualitative descriptions of quality. So, for example, when you do any sort of, of inventory management, you might come across, okay, the quality of the product. Good, bad, terrible, right? That is another example where we have a non-numeric, right? We can't subtract or add good from okay, but we can say with some level of certainty that good is, is better, right? Is ranked higher than okay, right? So typically the examples of this is going to be quality rankings. And then, you know, uh, competition rankings are two good examples. Okay, moving down from n ordinal, right? Removing some limitations. Well, we've removed the limitation of not being able to imply rank. The next thing that we're going to remove is this limitation of non-numeric. We're going to start to be able to actually use some math to actually look at these things. And what we're going to do is we're going to get to this idea of interval. Right? So interval data is numeric. Data about an object. And we specify something called an arbitrary zero. Right. We say that interval data is numeric data about an object that has something called an arbitrary zero. And before I talk about interval data specifically, I actually want to jump right down to the next type, which is ratio data, because it helps to have them talk about them both at the same time. So the last type, the least limited type, is going to be what's called ratio data. And ratio data, again, is the same as interval. It's numeric data. about an object that has an absolute zero. Or sometimes you'll still hear them you'll hear them say absolute zero as non arbitrary. Right? So the difference between interval and ratio is this idea between arbitrary and absolute zero. So what does that mean? Let's give ourselves a little bit of space here. Right. <clears throat> so what an arbitrary zero means is an, arbitra an arbitrary zero means that zero of whatever we're measuring, right? Wh whatever the measure of that data is, 
zero was chosen arbitrarily by whoever developed the scale. Absolute zero, on the other hand, means that whatever you're measuring, zero actually means that there is nothing, right? That zero means there is nothing of that measured data. I know that doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense. So let's go ahead and talk about an example of, of arbitrary versus absolute zero. And I think the best possible way to directly compare interval and ratio data is to talk about an example of temperature. Right, and we're going to talk about temperature in degrees Fahrenheit versus temperature in degrees Kelvin. Because we're talking about the same phenomenon, temperature, but we're talking about two different scales and so hopefully you can get a feel for what this arbitrary zero means versus what this absolute zero means. So spoilers, when we talk about Fahrenheit, this is going to be interval. And when we talk about Kelvin, this is going to be absolute. Or I should, sorry, I should say ratio data. It's going to be ratio. Right? And so when we talk about zero, Right. What does zero degrees Fahrenheit mean? How is it defined? When you have zero degrees Fahrenheit, what are you actually measuring? Well, if you look it up, right, zero degrees Fahrenheit was established as the freezing point of a water salt mixture. Right, that's the definition of zero degrees Fahrenheit. So just by looking at this definition, right, you can already see, okay, well that clearly doesn't necessarily mean there's no more temperature, right? Because we can have below zero. Right? What does zero Kelvin mean? What does zero degrees Kelvin mean? Well, Kelvin is a measure of the energy able to be produced by a given object. Right? The higher the temperature, the more energy being produced. The lower the temperature, the less energy being produced. So zero degrees Kelvin means that there is no more heat. Right? There's no more energy. inside the object. And so hopefully you understand the difference between ratio, right, and absolute zero, meaning that zero means there's no more, right, there's no more energy. And temperature in Fahrenheit saying, oh, well zero is just a measure of the point at which this solution freezes. That's the difference between an arbitrary zero and an absolute zero, okay? It can be a little bit tricky to distinguish arbitrary and absolute. Generally speaking, the two things that I look for are, one, I look for how is zero defined, Right, if it uses some benchmark, like the freezing point of water, or elevation is another good example, right? Above mean sea level, well, what is zero? Zero is mean sea level, right? If, it, if the definition references something else, it's arbitrary. Right? If, if it references something else, you know it's going to be an arbitrary zero, which means it's going to be interval data. If it references itself going to zero, 
right? If it references itself and says something like zero means there's no more of this thing, that means it's going to be a ratio. And two, I think about negative numbers, right? Do negative numbers make sense? If negative numbers don't make sense, then it's absolute. If negative numbers make sense, then it's probably interval. The reason I say probably is you have to be a little bit careful here because a good example of this is money in your bank account, right? Zero money in your bank account means you have no money, right? It is under this first thing, how zero is defined would indicate that it's ratio. But you can somehow go into debt, right? You can, you can have a negative bank balance technically, but that doesn't really make sense necessarily. Right? Because it shouldn't exist, right? You shouldn't be able to go into debt. So in that sense, right, the money in your bank account is ratio data because it's defined as having a zero meaning no more of it. And negative numbers, even though they exist technically, don't really make sense in the in the construct of, of how we would think about it. So hopefully this makes sense, this difference between arbitrary zero for interval data and ratio data having an absolute zero absolute zero. The last thing that I want to talk about is to explain why this matters. Why have two different rankings or two different categories based on this idea of arbitrary versus absolute zero. The reason why is because this absolute zero gives us the power to be able to take ratios, right? So with interval data, right, we cannot take ratios. That's why it's called interval data. So we can add or subtract, but you cannot take ratios. Right, with ratio data, we can do everything. Right, we can add and subtract. And take ratios. What do I mean when I say take a ratio? So when I say take a ratio, think of it like comparing two values using multiplication, right? So for example, if we were to talk about money in our bank accounts and somebody says, I have $5 and somebody else says, I have $10, right? If this was interval data, the only thing we could say is that the second person has $5 more, right? That's addition and subtraction. Because it's ratio data, right? because the zero is absolute, we're able to say something like, oh, person two has twice as much. Right? And it's, it's an important distinction here because you'll see people make this mistake all the time. For example, technically, under these two definitions, right, the interval and ratio, technically, if we're looking at temperature measured in Fahrenheit, or Celsius for that matter, right? You could not say that Texas was twice as hot as Michigan because it's on an interval scale, right? So you would not be able to make that comparison. If you were talking about Kelvin, right, you could say because Kelvin has this absolute zero. So Kelvin data, Kelvin measured temperature data, you could say one location was twice as hot as another. Measured in Fahrenheit, though, you would not be able to. And you'll see people make that mistake a lot, where they'll try to create ratios from interval data, and technically that's not allowed. Hopefully this all made sense. And as always, if you have any questions, please reach out. Thank you.